you will find on the back table uh, books. They have uh, come. Uh, so I have hopefully enough there. There are about uh, 40 books. Uh, I was right in guessing uh, that they uh, run retail uh, $17, but I'm able to get it with 40% off. So if you don't have it, but you'd still like to have one, uh, take the book and uh, uh, it's my gift to you. Uh, also, uh, the uh, sheets uh, with the uh, PowerPoints are available on the back table too as well. So if you didn't get one of those, uh, you need to grab it. We've got one of the most important lessons from the whole Bible, uh, Genesis 15, and so I'm anxious to get started. Uh, and then later on, we will have uh, questions, and uh, Nancy will have the mic, and uh, they're to come forward, or you go to them? I'll go to them. You'll go to them. Okay, good. Well, thank you. Uh, let's ask the Lord's special help as we look into his word. We bless you, our Heavenly Father, with all that's within our being, because you have been so good to us. And in spite of the darkness of the hour, in which it seems to intensify by day and by week, yet we still know the light of the world is still operating and you will have success. Your plan will come about. So here we look into your unveiling the basis of that whole plan here in this portion in Genesis. Open our eyes, open our hearts, and help us to see the majesty of your person. For it's in your wonderful name we pray. Amen. So if you have your Bibles open to Genesis 15, uh, this is the section from which we will continue our study of Abraham, the friend of God, a character study. And the key verse, of course, is in verse 6, where it says, Abram believed the Lord, and he was, it was credited to him uh, as righteousness. And, uh, uh, or some texts say, God credited to him. And the little pronoun, it, is so important. And I'm going to argue that that has a special place. But first, let's look at just a word or two of introduction. The previous chapter from last week's lesson ended in chapter 14 with uh, Abram's uh, complete forfeiture of any claim to the plunder that he had gotten from rescuing uh, his uh, 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 nephew Lot uh, far north up by Dan in a surprise attack. He came home with all the loot. The four kings didn't get a scrap, apparently. They left and got out of there as fast as they could. So back came uh, the people, uh, including Lot and his wife and family, uh, in chapter 14, verses 22 through 24. Genesis 15 begins with God giving assurance that he would make him rich. So here looks like the man just took a poverty vow as he gave away everything and turned around and the Lord says there, uh, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram uh, in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. But what was the reward? And how was he to get it? Well, that's the point of this chapter. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, and you need to look at that. All the translators have problem with it because it's a new word for God. Only used here twice 
in verse 2 and again verse 8. It is Adonai Yahweh. Adonai Yahweh. And where will that occur next time? In the covenant made with David in 2 Samuel 7. Eight times it appears there. Eight times. Adonai Yahweh. And very few other times in the whole Bible of the word for the Lord occurs uh, some 5,000 times, but not this special form. This had a unique bearing and was used only in these passages, except for I think there are four or five other references outside of the covenant God made with Abraham, the covenant he made with David, and again, the new covenant. So we've got a a word here, the covenant God will make, or really the word for make is cut. God will cut a covenant with Abram in Genesis 15, and it's even a richer reward set forth in the plan of God. And this is what I call the promise plan of God. The Old Testament does not call it promise, but in the New Testament it does. It reflects on it and calls it the promise of uh, the Lord. So this is his plan. And uh, he is going to give to this man and his descendants a plan for the ages and for all the peoples of the world, including, hey, I got good news for you, us. (laughs) We get included in this. So that's about us. So if you want to cheer, this is the time to stand up. Uh, And we need to have the wave in the church. So I'm going to go from this side over that side, and everyone stand. (laughs) Okay, all right, I'm trying to help you. So let's start with four striking phrases. The first is, uh, that comes immediately here in verse 1, the word of the Lord came. The word of the Lord came. This is the fourth time that expression is going to be used in four chapters. Four times in four chapters where the word of the Lord was given to Abraham. Chapter 12, 1, 2, and 3. In uh, uh, chapter 12, verse 7, again, where he gives the land to them. Uh, The word of the Lord came. In chapter 13, verses 14 and 17, and now in chapter 15, verse 1. Four times, four times. It is the revelation from God that makes Abram, what? A prophet, a prophet, as Genesis 20, verse 7 will say. If you're taking notes, you want to put down Genesis 20, verse 7. Uh, uh, Earlier in time, prophets were called seers, the ones who could see the future. Uh, That's in 1 Samuel 9, verse 9. But then they were called uh, prophets later on. So just as a prophecy was called a vision, so the word of the Lord here is promised, like it was to Moses in Numbers 12, 6. That's one of the famous passages on prophecy in the Bible. It says, uh, where there are prophets of the Lord among you, I will reveal myself to them in visions. So if you happen to have a prophet among you in, in Israel, he said, I'm going to give myself to them through my word, but the word will come in a vision. And I will speak to them in dreams. So that was the promise given to them, even though most of these visions and dreams come to the prophets in the Bible in the evening hours, yet also there were instances where it came during the broad daylight too. So it's a little different than some people think this might be nightmares. No, no. (laughs) These were daymares. 
uh, if I might coin a new word. So uh, at any rate, uh, in, in these instances, uh, the prophet had a strong understanding of the fact that this was supernatural. It was a gift from God. And it was the means by which they knew the will and the plan of God with such sure, uh, surety and uh, certainty uh, that uh, there were uh, no doubts about it whatsoever. So uh, in a day and age in which we have some 300 uh, a thousand churches in the United States. There are precious few still that will go chapter by chapter, book by book, and take the revelation of God seriously. Even, I watched early this morning, uh, another one, I, I watch what's on the, the Trinity Broadcasting Network, TBN, and uh, he said, we're going to speak the word of God. And then he said, my topic is bubbles of thought. And he talked about bubbles of thought. Well, excuse me, baloney. Uh, 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 this, uh, this is not the word of God at all. Uh, Open the text up and put your finger on the text. I always told my students, hold one finger on the text and gesture with the other hand. And when that gets tired, put that one on the text and gesture with the one that was previously on the text. So if you see any of my students, they'll tell you that, <laughs> oh yeah, that's the guy that said, put your finger on the text. Well, at any rate... Uh, the second striking phrase here, and I have it on the second slide here, is uh, the word uh, fear not, uh, which also comes in verse 1. For just as Abram had defeated four eastern kings, which is no small deed, with just 318 trained men plus some other a people that joined it. What do you think four kings brought? I mean, they were outmaneuvered, outgunned, out everything. And yet God gave them the victory. This is typical of the way God operates often in the Bible. And uh, so they opposed uh, Abram, and yet such overbalanced odds may have worried him for the moment, but after his rout of the defeated troops, uh, he might even worry further. Uh, what if they reap vengeance? Because they're so much larger, they'll come back against us. But what does God say? Do not be afraid. Fear not. Fear not. Guy was normal. And he was afraid. And he understood the risk that we're here. But not only was there the word of God, which was the absolute grounding for everything he was going to do. So it should be for us too, by the way. And so to fear. What do we have to fear? Do we worry about where culture is gone? Yes. Do we worry where government's gone? Yes. Do we worry where prices are gone? Yes, but overall, the biblical text says, no, do not be afraid. I'm still in charge. I know what you're going through, but I'm also the Lord that will take you through all of that. <laughs> Some of us came through the Depression days, too. We understood what that was. Uh, and we've had those experiences that you've heard about, sitting at the table with nothing there, and a knock comes on the door and someone says, I want to share a supper with you. Yeah, those, those were real days. 1931, 32, 33, 34, 35. Okay, yeah, I am that old. Well, at any rate, uh, but this would not happen 
For our Lord watches over the affairs of all men and women and declared that for Abraham and for his people, it won't happen. It won't happen. What's the greatest word in the Bible? Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. How about that? Uh, Well, third striking phrase, uh, and that is, I am your shield. Uh, It's an obvious military metaphor. Uh, And uh, he had said not only that uh, this is my word, and don't be afraid, but now he says, I'm your shield. Our Lord promised to protect Abram and his seed and reward them handsomely. And ladies and gentlemen of the Church of Jesus Christ, same Lord still is making the same promises that he'll protect. Uh, Is the world going crazy? Yes, it is. But hey, in the plan of God, he told us it would go that way. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And anyway, he is our buckler and our shield. Uh, and uh, that ought to do for that. Even though nothing said at the time about what the grounds of that reward were, nor what would be the nature of the reward, yet the Lord already given Abram the promise in chapter 12, verses 2 through 3. And uh, uh, he gave the promise about inheriting the land. That's in Genesis 12, verse 7. And uh, uh, also that uh, he would bless them, which is no small thing. We do it when someone sneezes, so the Lord bless you. Uh, And it's sort of passing on. But in the Bible, that is serious stuff. And it is the gifted hand of God that comes. He promised also numerous children and seed that they would be a source of blessing for the whole world. And yet Abram had done nothing to earn it or to merit it. This reward is not coming to him for good behavior or for good work. It came as a freebie. This is real free church doctrine. Uh, even as Romans 4, verses 4 through 5 taught. Now to anyone who works, said Paul, their wages are not credited to them as a gift. Oh, yeah. But as obligation. Uh huh. However, to anyone who does not work but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, Their faith is credited. It's added up. What? As righteousness. God declares you and me, okay, the word righteous, we don't use that today. So let me use the current word. God declares us to be in the right. Whoa. With the likes of ourselves, Does the Lord know what he's doing? Oh, yeah. He said, you guys caused me a lot of pain. I went to the cross. Don't think this is just a toss away because I'm God. I said, eh, forget it. Oh, no. There was the cross there. There's a fourth striking phrase, and that's in verse 6. And uh, we meet this word for the first time in the Bible, believe. Abram's faith was counted as being in the right, righteous. In fact, there was no higher glory for any human than that he or she should count on God's faithfulness and his reliability. Not ours, but his. Now, that should be hard for an audience like this that lives in so much reformed territory. Uh, And therefore, we talk about the sovereignty of God. And so he is sovereign too. Oh yeah, 
So Abram's question then becomes, how will God do this for men? Chapter 15, verses 2 through 5. The literal rendering of the interrogative in uh, verse uh, 2. But Abram said, O Adonai Yahweh, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? Uh Uh-oh, that's a little bit of a wagging of the finger. Uh, Lord, you promised that. (laughs) I was 75. Guess what I am now? I'm blowing out a hundred candles. And I still don't have a kid. Uh, And the one who will inherit my state, I have a nice Arab boy who comes from, well, he says Damascus, but it's actually 10 miles north of Damascus, so it's a suburb there. Uh, Eliezer. And Abram said, you've given me no children. Ouch. So a servant in my household will be my heir. He figured that the Bible verse for the day was the Bible verse, uh, God helps them that help themselves. Hesitations one, two. Uh, And so he said, that's it. That's where you can get this. Uh, But that verse... You wouldn't believe it. It is such a great verse, but it raised a whole storm uh, of uh, people who have uh, come here. First of all, this man, Eliezer of Damascus, uh, the Lord promised that uh, he would be uh, not the Lord. It was Abram who promised he would be his Heir. What does Eliezer mean? El is God, E-L. Eli is my God, and Ezer is help. Uh, we used to sing in church, they changed the words. Here I raise my Eben Ezer, which means stone, Eben, or Evan, Ezer. Ezer is help, stone of help. We sang that in our church. I grew up as a boy, and I wondered. I looked around, see if anyone felt uneasy about it, but no one seemed to, so I figured I didn't know what the easer was. But everyone was uh, lifting it up. Here I raise my ebon easer. Well, it turns out it's a stone of help, a stone of help. Uh, and who was Eliezer? Perhaps... He was Arab by birth. Uh Uh-oh. Now, God gave this promise to Jews, but now we've got an Arab boy that's going to come into the picture. Uh, But wait a minute. The New Testament talks about this too. It does? Where? Well, you know the Hebrew Eliezer is a a (laughs) pulcapated. There, there's a word, the new one, uh, shortened form, apocopated, a form of Greek for what? Lazarus. The name Lazarus and Eliezer are the same. Uh, in Luke 16, 23, the rich man, remember, uh, and uh, Lazarus. Uh, Lazarus, Lazarus, is represented as dying, and he goes to Abraham's bosom, which is a term for heaven in the Old Testament. While that might be a covert allusion to the fact that uh, here is another Gentile who had been converted and put his faith in the coming man of promise. Uh, So, uh, this is an interesting situation here that comes with this man, Eliezer, who should be connected when they say it in Greek as Lazarus. So it suggests that Old Testament Eliezer uh, may have believed in the coming man of promise, even though he was Arab. Of course, God said he would be bringing 
blessings to all the peoples of the earth. That had been already in Genesis 12, 3. Uh, and uh, uh, so those who believed and died went to heaven, called the bosom of Abraham. Otherwise, why bring Abraham's name up by Jesus in this uh, connection? But Abram's Eliezer was not to be his heir. For that heir was to come, where? Verse 4, from his own body. That's what it said. And that was the promise. Apparently, Abram's wife, Sarai, was sterile. Yeah, we know that from chapter 11, verse 30. But despite Abram's adoption of Eliezer as his son, and by the way, I had to read Many cuneiform documents from Mari, Alalak, and other places in graduate school where they said just that. Uh, so and so, uh, I don't have any children. My wife uh, has not been able to conceive. And so I have adopted, and they would name this other man. And he will mourn for us at our death. So they wanted someone at their funeral. And it were these uh, uh, adoptees. And they will inherit everything that belongs to me. I mean, that reads over and over again. No wonder that in the patriarchal age we have that happening too as well. Uh, so Abram had followed the custom of that day in adopting Eliezer, for according to the documents, one of them was called Nuzi, N-U-Z-I, Nuzi. Uh, an adopted servant could inherit the rights that would have gone to the natural-born son when there was such a son. Uh, but uh, the son, Isaac, was born here uh, as a surprise. Sarah was 90. I'll bet the ladies talked about that uh, over the back fence as they hung out wash. Uh, and uh, uh, he was born, uh, and all that changed. Chapter 21, verse 2. Therefore, Isaac would be the son of promise. Galatians 4, 28. Just as we who belong to Jesus Christ are likewise called children of promise. Uh, Paul declared that in Galatians 4.21 uh, through 31. Moreover, God promised that Abram and his offspring would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. That's quite a bit. We have never, still are not able to count up all the stars in heaven. We're going to billions uh, and even beyond that. A promise that was repeated to Abraham over and over again. And which promise was marveled at in Romans 4.18 and Hebrews 11.12. The Bible still is talking about what God did. So what is that promise, Galatians 4? Therefore... Uh, uh, it says here, brothers, we are not children of a slave woman, Hagar, but we are children of the free woman. Remember the point made in Galatians 4. So that's the theme here. Abram's belief in the coming man of promise is central to our lesson. Did the people in the Old Testament believe the same way that we do in order to get eternal life. Yes. Uh, uh, Acts 4.12. There's only uh, one meter, one God between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. No other name is given under heaven. And so, therefore, uh, that's what this teaches so we come to verse 6 
And my NIV just says, Abram believed. But actually, the Hebrew, I checked it, it says, and Abraham believed. And the NIV, which I worked on, left that out. <laughs> Those guys are going to stand in line on the final day. Why? Well, because they said, some of my best friends, I mean, I have a book coming this week, The Old Testament Really Matters. Uh, and uh, one of the guys whom I'm going to cite here, Alan Ross, he and I have kidded each other uh, unmercifully at conferences where we've both spoken. Alan uh, uh, taught up in Portland. He now is teaching at Dallas. Uh, and uh, he says, uh, no, the syntax of Hebrew suddenly changes here. Well, that's true. But he says it interrupts the narrative to, uh, which was that God is going to bless uh, and then all of a sudden, verse uh, 6 starts out with, uh, then the word of the Lord, uh, uh, excuse me, it's verse 6, is Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. Uh, they don't see the connection that Abraham believed because of the four big truths that had just been stated. The word of God, fear not, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, they described this, and another one, another friend, uh, who is a Southern Baptist man, also good man, good theology, but they slip up here, and they hotly debate uh, that uh, Abram here finds the strongest case for the fact that the object of his faith and his salvation was no one less than this one that would be the heir of the Lord pointing to our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, that uh, it would, the line would come from Abram's body. And that's why Acts 4.12 says, there's no other salvation, no other name under heaven whereby we must and can and will be saved, which is the name of Jesus, or as they say in Hebrew circles, Yeshua, uh, which is the Hebrew pronunciation of his name. So the central text in this debate is verse 6, and Abraham believed the Lord. The end is important because it shows this flows from verses 1 through 5 because of what God had said. And therefore, Abraham believed uh, at the Lord and it was credited to him. Uh, what was credited? Well, it in Hebrew is feminine, so we look for an antecedent. But the only feminine word there would be the verb to believe, which in the noun form is feminine. So uh, it was credited what? The belief that uh, uh, God uh, had uh, been the one who would uh, be their righteousness. So... Uh, uh, some say this, let me give you just a quote here from uh, these uh, uh, fellows who I'm uh, taking a little umbrage at. Uh, verse 6, they say, falls immediately, verses 2 through 5. Yeah. Uh, and it would suggest that Abram's faith was in response to the preceding promise. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, but what they are arguing is the syntactical form of the verb believed precludes that interpretation. Huh? Well, why? Well, it's in the Hebrew past tense. Well, so is it in English, believed. And the precise nuance of the syntax here 
should be an imperfect form of the verb, uh, like vayomer, which is used in narrative uh, cases. Uh, but at any rate, those guys will have to stand in line on the final day. So if you see my good friend Alan or uh, Brother Ferris in line, uh, go to the other line. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, what is it? Uh, oh, Alan Ross said, if the writer had wished to show that this verse followed the preceding sequence, he would have used the normal structure for the narrative sequence. Uh, uh, min. Uh, and then he believed. But see, since he didn't use that, they get all bent out of shape. But actually, the grammarians don't know fully yet why that form was used. It's a question of trying to figure out uh, what the grammar should say based on usage. Well, uh, both of these analyses of these two men leave the context dangling. At, by omitting the word and. Uh, why did the writer of uh, Genesis 15, 6 include the word and? Furthermore, not all the grammarians of Hebrew are agreed about the meaning of the vav uh, plus the uh, Hebrew perfect is used here. Uh, by omitting the conjunction and they created another problem to solve the first problem, which, uh, excuse me, ain't the way to go. So my conclusion is that verse 6 must be connected and the word and used, for that is how it's written. By the way, I think ESV, some of you are using, has and, doesn't it? Uh, the ESV did, yeah. So they restored that. Well, 25 years previously to this episode, Abram had obeyed God and had left his homeland, uh, the city of Ur, and then went up to Haran, where his father died, and then he journeyed on to Canaan. Uh there is never a notice given in chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, that he had in the interim believed in the Lord. That's rather interesting. All this time and no word about belief. Now notice comes in chapter 12 that in the, this instance now where God gives these four significant words that Lo and behold, uh, he believed. And uh, God said, all right, I'm going to add that up. And it stands as uh, the judge comes down and says, case dismissed. All offenses standing against him have now been cared for by this court. What then shall we say is faith? Is it faithfulness? As most commentators say today, I say, no, no, it is not. The Hebrew word emuna uh, is more accurately rendered here as faith or trust, not faithfulness, especially in this text. And Abraham believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteous. Since there's no antecedent for the word uh, feminine form, it, uh, the uh, Genesis 15, 6, therefore uh, mentions it uh, as uh, uh, a word that we must seek out, and I think the word is uh, believe. How does one become righteous in this context? Righteousness is not viewed as an ethical term, but instead as a religious term. It has, as we say, a legal or forensic aspect in that it was the judge's term. 
whereby he pronounced the person clear, innocent, free of all charges. Uh, and uh, so, uh, thus the righteous person is not one who worked for a certain ethical status uh, or one who showed his or her faithfulness as if in the Old Testament they had to keep the law and then in the New Testament we got a better deal, which is uh, just uh, believing. No, no, no. No one. That's what Acts 4 says. There's no other salvation except by believing in Jesus. So if you think there are some good people who are good in other religions, yeah, they may be good, ethically good, morally perfect, but they need to be saved. And the Bible is constant in all 66 books. They're saved the same way. People in the Old Testament were not saved by a different plan than in the New Testament. Uh, that's the theme there. Uh, so the righteous will live by faith. But that brings us down to the real key point, which is the Abrahamic covenant, verses 7 following. And here in verse 7, the opening statement is, in verse 7, he also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to take possession of it. I am Yahweh. He uses the form there, Y-H-W-H, which we think is best translated or pronounced Yahweh. Uh, and what does he give us the main thing? I brought you out of the land of you are Ur of the Chaldees. Uh, and later on, he's going to use that identical phrase 125 times. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of, not Ur, Egypt. Matter of fact, he puts the Ten Commandments. That's verse 1. I am the Lord God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Uh, and therefore, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And on down. Commandment 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It is the commandments of God, listen to this, are in the environment of grace. Grace. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. So that means it's a freebie. It's the graciousness of God. Therefore, do this. Don't do this, do this, do this, do this. Did you keep all those? Yeah. Okay, then you're in heaven under the Old Testament plan. No, no, no. Nine, mix, nipa, net. Uh, it just is not true at all. Uh, and therefore, in this second revelation from God, no mention is made of a vision, but it still is a word that apparently came directly from God. The reason God had brought Abram out of Ur and then out of the land of Haran, H-A-R-A-N, was to give him the land of Canaan, verse 7, last part. But Abram's question was this, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it, verse 8? Apparently, this was the request for a sign or some kind of guarantee, some kind of assurance. How do I know? How do I know? And later on, there are men like that. Gideon will ask, Lord, give me a sign. Remember, he gave them one about the uh, sponge being filled with dew, and next time everything else was had dew on it not on this fleece that he put out there. So, uh, or what about Hezekiah? Hezekiah's told God will give him 15 more years of life. He said, how do I know? And the Lord said, okay, I'll cause the sundial to go back eight degrees. 
That's a sign. And God was giving assurance by that. Uh, and uh, by his name, Adonai Yahweh, verse 2 and verse 8. And also in the Davidic covenant, where it occurs, I said eight times, it's seven. I see my notes say. And chapter 7, verse 18, twice in verse 19, 29, uh, uh 28, 22, etc. So sometime then there must have passed by uh, our story here as Abram watched over the scene of uh, what is happening. For God told him now to prepare something. For the uh, uh, Lord told him, verse 9, Bring a heifer, a goat, and a ram. Not my truck. This is a, an animal. Uh, and each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Okay, so we've got five things there. A heifer, that's a young calf, uh, a goat, and a ram. And uh, three years uh, old, so we have this uh, cow and goat and uh, also the male sheep, ram, uh, each three years old, along with the dove and the young pigeon. And Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two. Now he's making a covenant. There's the word karat, to cut, to make a covenant. That's the one. I fool my class on it and say it's an ancient Japanese root, karate, uh, karate. Uh, so he cut the covenant. At least they remember it. Uh, and and he said he brought them, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. That is, with a path between them. And the birds uh, also with them. He did not cut them in half. They were too small. Then the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. So the vultures immediately sense there's death there, and typical vultures, they start circling over top, and Abram chases them away. But toward evening, I guess, Abram gets kind of tired of all of that, and as the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep. Tordema. The Hebrew word there is the same kind that uh, Adam fell into a deep sleep. <laughs> and God ribbed him uh, and made this girl. Uh, and uh, oh, also Jonah was in a deep sleep. Yeah. The whole ship is rocking apart. He's sunk. He really has had it uh, with God trying to get out of being a missionary to the people he hated the most, uh, the Assyrians. So um, uh, the Lord goes on to say here, know for certain, in verse 12, that uh, for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. How about that? The Lord warns him that your relatives are going to go to Egypt. Actually, that's a round number because Exodus 1240 says it was 430 years. Thank you. But 400 will do as a round number. And they will be enslaved and mistreated. But I will punish the nation uh, uh, they serve as slaves. Did he? Oh, yeah. Uh, watch the uh, Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments. He couldn't even get the waves to roll back. So they had waves, and he ran the camera backwards. That's how they got it. Uh, and uh, sort of, But the Lord did it forwards. Uh, uh, I'm just helping you here. Uh, but uh, I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and after they will come out with great possessions, Oh, yeah, the people, they went there and said, <laughs> we're leaving town. They said, 
good riddance. Here, take anything. Take my jewelry. Take uh, uh, my rings. Anything. They gave him everything. They came out loaded. Why? They needed to build the tabernacle. How about that? Uh, donations that came uh, from the uh, wicked. Sometimes they say, what about a, uh, a man who runs the local bar and wants to make a big gift to the church building program? Should we take it? Uh, well, uh, think of this passage. Well, at any rate, when the sun, verse 17, had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land from the wadi of Egypt to the great river. Oh, the wadi of Egypt. Some think that's the Nile. No, 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 no. Uh, that one's called the river Nile, not the wadi. And what is this? Well, just 30 miles south of where the Philistines were, on the beach of the Mediterranean Sea, now cut on a 45-degree angle all the way down to the Gulf of Aqaba, across the Sinai Peninsula. And that's the Wadi of Egypt. The Wadi of Egypt. And what about up north? Well, that's always called the River Parat. Never any other ones, 60 sometimes, I think it is. Uh, it is the Euphrates, all the way up to Damascus area. The Lord says, I'm giving you all this territory. Has Israel ever inherited that much territory? No, no. Not even in the division of the land with West Bank, uh, with the Jordanians and Arabs. Uh, so that all is put in as one. Uh, and uh, so uh, what happens here is as the sun was setting, an opportunity for another spoken message from God came. A thick and dreadful darkness came over them. Verse 12. A thick and dreadful darkness came over them. Probably it indicated that in the midst of this deep sleep, Abram felt a deep disturbance in his soul, something like a nightmare or some deep dread uh, or fear gripped his heart. Abram is now told that his offspring would enter into the land of Egypt uh, and they would be oppressed for 400 years verse 13 uh, through 16. This figure, as I said, may be a round number because Exodus 1240 says it actually was 430 years they were in Egypt. However, when Jacob and his family would first enter Egypt, it would be under the direction of Jacob's son, Joseph, who had become number two in the land. Uh, and they had it well, uh, easy for those opening years. But then a new government came that didn't recognize Joseph, and they were thrown into slavery. Uh, and uh, so uh, what happens here is uh, up to this point, when God was speaking to Abram prophetically, the sin of the Amorites had not yet reached his full measure. You see that in verse 16? God waits for a culture, and it keeps loading, 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 loading sin until it boils over. And it is at that point the Lord says, Fini, you're done. So it is with the United States that if there is no revival and turning back of God's people and sin keeps up, 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 up till it gets to the brim and goes over, here's your basis here. Uh, for sin 
reaches its full measure. So don't worry if there's not a judgment. Is somebody in charge around here? Yeah, the Lord is. Will he judge for those bases? Yes, yes. And when the sun had fully set and darkness had fallen over the land, verse 17, on that momentous day of revelation, God appeared as a smoking pot with a blazing torch. Uh, or as the Hebrew literally says, an oven of smoke and a torch of fire, verse 17. Today we think of a modern oven in a different way. But this oven, in the Hebrew it's tanur. We have a spot in Israel we speak of that place as tanur, T-A-N-N-U-R. But it seems to have been something like a large earthenware jar where normally the dough was not put inside the jar to cook, but sort of slinked over the upside-down side of the jar. But the jar inside was filled with charcoal. And by putting the jar near the fire, it became an oven. This is very typical. We find that throughout the Near East. So there are not two things here. Uh, some want to make uh, uh, two things, but no, it is the composite oven, which was the jar, which is made out of clay, and it has a fire inside. So it's upside down, and you put the pancakes like uh, on the outside and just attach them to the base of that and over the fire, and uh, that's how the Lord appeared. But what did he do? Oh, this is it. You've got to listen. This is terribly important. This divides Christianity right now because it said, the Lord then walked between the cut pieces like this oven that I've just described to you. Meaning what? Meaning this. The Lord says, if I don't keep what I promise to Israel and to the nations of the world with my salvation and my blessing, then may I be like these animals, like this heifer, like this uh, goat, like this uh, 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 ram, this male sheep, and these two birds. What's he saying? He's taking an oath. He is putting a curse on himself, uh, a form of self-imprecation. And he says, may I, God, die if I don't do what I said. Ooh. This is really tough stuff. Now, so what's the debate about? Some people don't believe this is only God walking the police between the pieces. Where's Abraham? He's sunk. He's in a deep sleep. The guy's out of it. He's been chasing birds all day. And he's tired. And so he's snoring. But who takes the oath God? So what's the debate? Some still say, yeah, but we are obligated. If we don't do certain things, then we won't be saved. Really? Really? This text says no. God says, I'll do it. I promised it. I'm the one who promised. I'll be faithful. You just trust me. Do you trust me? well, Lord, yeah, but I want to help some. I mean, it's not nice to go to a place and at least offer to clean up. Yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll help some. No, no, Lord said, I did it all. So we sing, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left a terrible blot, but he has washed it all clean as snow. That's great theology, I'm telling you. 
you don't get a better deal than that. Uh, they may have some raffles or things or some former quarterbacks from the Cowboys who give money uh, if you guess uh, the scores. But uh, this is even better than that stuff altogether. So the interpretation here in verse 18, on that day the Lord made a covenant. Literally, he cut uh, a promise with Abram. A good parallel passage which helps us to understand the covenant ceremony is found in Jeremiah 34, verse 18, where the Lord spoke of the people passing between the divided or dismembered parts of a calf. In so doing, the people on that day, in Jeremiah's day, were risking taking a curse on themselves and becoming just like the dismembered animals if they failed to perform. But this is different. Okay, this has similarities in which uh, Christ as the oven here passes between the pieces, but there is no obligation on our part except believe. Only trust him. Only trust him, we sing. Uh, and so it is here too as well. So the Lord was saying, in effect, may I be made like these animals if I do not do the covenant that I promised I would do. Therefore, when in Genesis God walked between the pieces, God invoked a curse on himself. If he failed to fulfill the promises, it's important to notice that Abram did not walk between the pieces as well, but was sound asleep, off to the side. So as part of that covenant cutting, um, the Lord gave Abram the delineation of the boundaries of the land. The Lord had promised the land before in Genesis 12, 7, but he had not specified the boundaries. Now he begins to do that. Half of the Sinai is cut on an angle, uh, say from the 11 o'clock position down to the 5 o'clock position. And that was the Wadi, Egypt. And all the way north, over 125 150 miles up to the Euphrates River, which would include uh, Lebanon, Phoenicia, uh, and down all the way into that desert region, half of the Sinai Peninsula. So now the Lord will do so by beginning with the southern border, Wadi El Arish, and uh, uh, which is called in Hebrew uh, Nahar Mitzrayim, all the way up to the great river Euphrates called Nahar Parat. Uh, and it was thought by some that the Lord meant the Nile River or the eastern branch of the Nile River, uh, but uh, the word uh, Nahal, Wadi, instead of Nahar River, shows that he means something different, depicted a smaller brook or a seasonal uh, runoff of rain, uh, but not the river uh, Nile. Well, uh, uh, the names here of 10 foreign tribes, this is the longest list given in the Bible, are listed in verses 19 through 21. Uh, and uh, uh, it is uh, it omits some nations like the Philistines and the Moabites, but it includes other little known Kenites and Kenizzites and Cadmonites. Uh, so uh, apparently it's uh, selective because Stephen's list in Acts seven uh, gives speaks of the seven nations. So. 
we need here then conclusions. God once again came to Abram with his word of revelation. And I tell you, except for the marvelous preaching of the word of God, line upon line, verse upon verse, holding our finger on the verse <laughs> and gesturing with the other hand, uh, we remain uh, in a famine. And I announce to you that the famine today is large, large. Uh, my three favorite TV guys, uh, uh, I think uh, David, Jeremiah, Michael, Youssef, and uh, uh, Tony Evans, uh, they are examples. They go by the book and say what the word says. But so many others are giving sort of topical things here and there and won't do the word. Abram complained to the Lord that he was still without any promised children. But the Lord says to him, uh, I'll give you a reward. You believe, trust me, and it'll be counted to you uh, for righteousness. So God cut a covenant with Abram by walking down the aisle and saying, like this, like this, like this, like this, like this, like this. I will be if I don't do what I told you. That's how sure it is. So why did God reject Abram's adoption of Eliezer, especially if he might have been a believer too as well? Because in his plan, I don't know why, he picked a particular nation because they were smarter, been seen that way, because they were more numerous, he said they weren't, because they were more faithful, no, they were the worst. But in order to show his grace, you say, oy vey, how come those guys, the Lord said, because of my grace, not because they were so good. And that gives encouragement to all the rest of us too. Not because we're so good, we're resaved. I mean, the angels were not surprised, were they, when you and I came to believe in Jesus? So they quick had to get some sheet music and say, Kaiser, just repent it. Come on, let's sing. Uh, I, I don't think, they knew it. They were prepared. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll take it easy. But uh, the biblical text is beautiful. And what a chapter, Genesis 15. It's the hallmark for all that God's going to do. But does he know about Egypt? Yes. Does he know what's going to happen with the nations? Yeah. Does he know how the whole thing ends, the whole story ends? Oh, yeah. He said, I've been there. I've been there. I know about that. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And trust my word, won't you? And anyway, have you believed? Oh, good. That's my gift to you. Enjoy it. Oh, you haven't believed? Well, sillies. And you mean you've been in an evangelical free church and you still haven't believed? Come on. It's free. What do you want? Uh, I mean, even Dutch people would take that deal. <laughs> well, thank you for your kindness. We'll leave more time next week. I'm sorry I got all excited, but hey, it's a good passage. So I wasn't going to let it just sort of go. Let me just close in prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for our time together. Now go with us and help us. We've talked about some mighty important things, some beautiful things, and yet some things that even take us out of our depth. But we trust you. We still trust you and what you have Revealed to us in your word, we give you thanks. Help us to live as those who are equipped with the powerful word and presence of the living God. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.